Hi, I'm uh, Jacob Hickman. I'm a faculty in our Department of Anthropology, and it's been an absolute pleasure to co-organize this event with the Kennedy Center between Anthropology and the Kennedy Center. Uh, I want to keep this introduction brief, but also convince you of the value that stands in looking up uh, Professor Robbins' work if you're not familiar already. Uh, so just to quickly introduce you, give you a sense of, of who he is. Uh, he was trained his undergrad degree at Grinnell College, then his MA and PhD at the uh, University of Virginia, where he uh, worked with Roy Wagner, one of the intellectual giants and uh, figures in our discipline. Um, his first post was at Reed College, after which he spent uh, the bulk of his career at, at UCSD and uh, several, uh, University of California, San Diego, and more recently been appointed as the Sigurd Rousing Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Cambridge. Um, it's not an understatement to say that uh, Professor Robbins' work really has defined uh, a field in, within our discipline, the anthropology of Christianity, before his work. It's, it's easy to argue that, in fact, anthropologists tended to see Christianity largely in terms of the power structures and colonial processes in the world. Whereas Professor Robbins' work, which we'll hear about extensively, I won't give you a preview of that, forced anthropologists to really take the moral and theological worlds of Christians more seriously. Um, and there are various reasons why, up to that point, anthropologists hadn't done that. But it really spawned the field of the anthropology of Christianity. I would uh, point you all to his book, Becoming Sinners, highly recommended. We assign it regularly in our anthropology courses. Um, and building on that, his work really began to define uh, one of the major axes of debate and dis uh, within our discipline around the nature of morality and ethics and how we think about morality and ethics across different cultural contexts, which we'll hear about today. Um, I, I highly encourage you to look him up. He's, he's really made some in incredible field-defining arguments. He's an uh, intellectual giant in our field. And we're just absolutely pleased to hear from him today. So if you'll join me in welcoming Professor Robbins. Wow. Well, um, thank you, Jacob, for that more than gracious introduction. And I wanted to thank uh, uh, Quinn Meekham and, 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 and Corey Leonard for, for welcoming me here. I, I think every speaker goes anywhere begins by saying how happy they are to be wherever they are. But I'm going to take a second to say that and, 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 and try to convince you that I really mean it in terms of being here at BYU today. I have been somehow connected to BYU since the very beginning, not the very beginning of my anthropological education, but since I entered grad school, there was a BYU student in my graduate cohort. I don't know what's happened to him, Bruce Josephson. Uh, uh, then shortly thereafter, I, I picked up a, a friend and mentor who's actually here, uh, David Knoll, who was really, really important in my intellectual formation, who had been a student here and has had other connections here. And then I've gone on to have um, a, uh, probably the largest number of my graduate students, which isn't a huge number, but have come from BYU. Uh, I, I learned all the way back then from Bruce Josephson that BYU really has a long tradition of anthropology and of thinking seriously about cross-cultural issues. Uh, I've been here once before. I've spoken at UVU. I've, I've always really enjoyed it because I think this is a place where people take the kinds of issues anthropologists care about really, really seriously as live live issues and not just not just sort of distanced academic concerns. So really very, very happy to be here. And I, I also want to thank uh, Jacob in particular because we, we started planning this before COVID and it's been, it's taken way too many emails to make this happen. So <laughs> thanks to Jacob. Um, I recently published a book called the Theology and the Anthropology of, of Christian Life. And the purpose of that book was to explore what anthropology might learn from uh, Christian theology that would be useful both for anthropologists studying Christians around the world, but also for the anthropological study of human life more generally. And you could say there were two, two motivations for this. There were probably several more also, but two that I'll mention. One is, as Jacob said, anthropologists now study Christianity. A lot of them do. In fact, it's 
it's definitely it's it's enough of a trend that you know a lot of people are sick of it by now. <laughs> but it's uh, it's it used to be that anthropologists kind of carefully avoided Christianity as a topic of study. We don't have time to get into the reasons for that. Now, many, 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 many anthropologists study Christianity, and so there's a lot more knowledge of at least folk theology around in anthropology now of the kind of the theology of the people anthropologists study but also more knowledge of academic theology, which is what I really try to address in, in, in the book. So this was a good anthropologist with theology because they've, they've developed some skill in thinking about Christianity and Christian lives. At the same time, the same time as anthropologists were developing interest in Christianity, theologians and religious studies scholars were, were inventing a category that really wasn't there before, the, which is global Christianity. I don't know if that gets talked about here or not. Uh, it's very interesting to trace the history of that term. I try to do that a little bit in this book. But that meant they were suddenly very interested in cross-cultural expressions of Christianity, which used to not, not be such an important topic. So it seemed like a good moment to try to bring these two fields into conversation, because in a way they were turning toward each other anyway, for their own reasons. But the second reason I thought it was a good thing to do is that whatever else they are, and they, they are both more than what I'm going to say they are, but anthropology and Christianity, at least in part, I mean, anthropology and theology, at least in part, do want to study the nature of human life and its possibilities. They, they may want to study more than that, but they do want to study that, so they ought to have some things in common. That was the wager I made, or some things to say to each other, not just in common, but some things to say to each other. And that was kind of the gam, the bet I placed in developing this book. And in the book, I take up a, a whole bunch of important theological topics, such as the nature of conversion, the nature of atonement, and sin, which interestingly is very, very unsettled across Christian traditions, kind of unlike the Trinity. Uh, atonement never got sort of canonized into one version, so I look a little at that. Uh, I look at, at, at well-developed Christian notions of the gift, which is also a topic that anthropology feels very, very strong uh, commitment to. I look at eschatology, something Jacob works on a lot, and ideas about how the world will end and where the world's going. And then I look, in the last chapter, at the role of the secular in shaping and sort of grounding anthropology and the other social sciences as modern disciplines and ask what an encounter with Christian theology can do to help anthropology think about its own limitations. It thinks of itself as a field that is open to the whole world, but of course n no, nobody is open to the whole world. We all have our limits, and the secular defines some of the key limits for anthropology. So what, what does that mean? But as it happens, I'm not going to talk about any of those topics today. That was, that was kind of the advertisement or the giving you the setting out my stall, as the English say. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is something that I thought was very suited to a talk sponsored by the Kennedy Center for International Studies. Um, and that is the topic of what anthropologists can learn from theologians about the possibility of judging aspects of the Christian lives or the Christian doctrines of the people we study or the people we read. I chose this topic for today because I believe that thinking about how scholars might pass judgments across cultural boundaries is or should be one important part of thinking about international relations today. And this is so, at least I would claim, is because we're at a moment where cross-cultural contact is very much the norm, not the exception. You know, when I came into anthropology in, in the early 80s, it was still news to a lot of people that there were other cultures out there and that they saw things differently and they were complex. Not so anymore. None of you, none of the younger people in this room probably ever lived in that world. So cross-cultural contact is absolutely the norm and not the exception now. But it's also true at this moment that the norms that organize these encounters, at least from the Western side, norms that are connected to ideas such as human rights, development, global health, and, and even missionization by a whole range of world religions 
all of those no, the norms of engagement that come with those projects carry their own culturally shaped visions of what constitutes a good life. And, and people involved in those kinds of international projects often use their visions of the good life to judge the lives of others to be less good than they could be. So there's a lot of judgment going on in international relations these days. You know, whether we want there to be or not, that's a fact about the world. So I think it, it, it's a good time to think about what it means to judge cross cultures, but across cultures. But there's another reason that it's, it's, an, it's a good time to do this. And that's because I think that anthropology, even in the last seven, eight years, which is the time I started to write this chapter of the book, that I'm drawing from, which was the first chapter that I wrote, even since then, even in the last six, seven years, anthropology has really changed the way it thinks about judgment. Or if it hasn't changed it, the idea of anthropologists passing judgments across cultures has become a really fraught issue in a way I'll try to convince you that it didn't used to be. So part of what I want to do is say, well, if anthropologists are passing a lot of judgments across cultures now, it might be useful for them to look at theology as a discipline that's been passing those kind of judgments for a very long time. And so that's what I'm going to try to look at today, what anthropology might learn from theology about how to go about passing judgments across cultures. Okay. In order to, to convince you that there's been this change in anthropology, I'm going to have to do a very quick step back into the history of the discipline. I'm going to do this very quickly, but, uh, but it'll, yeah. Um, and the point I want to make is that for a long time, anthropologists thought they had or, or felt they had principled reasons for withholding judgment on the quality of the lives or situations of the people they studied. Indeed, anthropologists tended to argue that for anthropologists to generate worthwhile knowledge of the lives of people living in different societies or cultures, they needed to withhold judgment in that way. On taking this view, anthropologists were situating themselves in a tradition that went all the way back to the founding of the social sciences in the late um, 1800s. And probably the, the most famous version of this non-judgmental view was expressed by Max Weber who famously, I have, people have encountered him, I'm sure, across all the social sciences and definitely also in international relations. Um, but one of his most famous pronouncements was, social scientists can't help but let their own values direct them to what's important to study. Right? You're only going to study things you think are important or interesting, and you're going to make those decisions based on your own values. However, once you decide to study a certain topic with another group of people, you have to let their values guide your research. Otherwise, your research won't be objective. It'll just be about your values. Okay, it's, a, it's a complicated argument, but it, it, it's become very, it became a very, very, very standard argument across the social sciences, and it's there in anthropology, too. Okay? Um, let me give you an example of what Weber had in mind just really, really quickly, right? If you're studying people involved in a religious movement, say a millenarian movement, which some of you may know about from teaching in anthropology here or whatever, and they say that this, in this movement is caused by God, if you want to understand them, you want to understand what it means to them to participate in a movement that's caused by God. You can't immediately consult your own sensibilities and your own values and try to explain away their sense that it's caused by God by saying, well, actually it's because they've been through massive cultural change or they're oppressed or they've been through a natural disaster or something like that. First, to understand them objectively, you have to, you have to understand what it means for them to live in a movement that is caused by God, okay? So during the hundred or so years of anthropology's existence, the fact that anthropologists tended to study people who lived very different lives 
uh, than their own. This has changed a lot recently also. But the fact that they tended to study people who lived very differently than themselves meant that they developed a special version of this idea that you need to study people from their own point of view and not from your own if you want to have objective knowledge of them. And the special view of this notion of not passing judgments across cultures in order to better understand them is called cultural relativism. Okay, um, And the version of this claim that has been central to anthropology holds that, um, I'm going to give like a real textbook definition here, uh, all aspects of a social world or a culture make sense when they're understood in their own context. Things people do or say will only look strange or freakish or in need of some kind of explanation beyond what the people themselves give as an explanation if they're taken out of context and understood from your own point of view, from the point of view of your own values, not from the point of view of theirs. Okay? Let me give you just a very, very quick example uh, of what I mean by this this business of not immediately relating them to your own ideas and trying to understand them in context. Uh, the, I worked in Papua New Guinea with a very small language group of 400 people living very remotely without electricity, without, um, without access to the cash economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I brought with me uh, a lot of, of, of antibiotics and other medicines from the US. And people were always very excited to try to get these medicines from me. Um, in some sense, it was a status symbol to get them. I mean, even when people weren't sick, they, they wouldn't mind getting them if they could. But people really, it was a way of relating. It was a way, for those of you who were in uh, the Anthro 101, it was a way of exchanging. It was a way of making a relationship. People always wanted these medicines, with one exception. People who were really, really sick and who I thought really needed medicines because they were wasting away and, and often were on death's doorstep, would refuse the medicines. I'd actually go to them. You know, they were too sick to come to me. And I would try to give them the medicines, and they would refuse them. And I, and I would say, well, why don't you take this? I think it could help. And they'd say, no, it's no use. I'm, I'm already dead. Now, evaluated in relation to my own ideas about life and death and the power of medicines, this about face in people's usual desire to have the kind of pills I brought with me made no sense, right? All the time people wanted them, except when, in my estimation, they most needed them. But if you realize that for Eurotman, all deaths are understood to be caused by sorcery, and that sorcerers operate by eating all of your meat, all of your muscles and organs and things, and then stuffing you full of leaves and making you forget that you ever met them and sending you back home to quickly waste away as the leaves rot and all that, it begins to sound a little less strange. And in fact, it makes sense of how quickly people who live with, you know, very much, they don't have a whole lot of protein in their diet. And I mean, people really waste away very, very quickly, but it just begins to make sense. It doesn't make why would they take medicines when, in fact, they had died a few days ago? They just hadn't, hadn't realized it then. Now, if telling you about Eurotman sorcery were like my main goal today, I, I could say a lot more, including some things about why these ideas about sorcery kind of work very well in the context of, of Eurotman life. But that's, that's not what we're after today. So I'll just leave it there, because my goal was just to point out how the anthropological goal of not judging other lives from the point of view of the values and understandings of our own helps us make good sense of those lives. It helps us do good science in the way Weber thought withholding judgment of those we study ought to help you to do good science, right? And I just said, oh, they're just so ignorant and, and walked away frustrated that they wouldn't take the medicine, I, I wouldn't have been doing good science. I would have passed judgment on the state of their knowledge, but I would not actually have understood them. So in very brief terms, this is what anthropological uh, relativism looks like. And I would suggest that along with the notion of culture, which is very disputed today, but nonetheless has been enormously important throughout, throughout the world, and the genre of writing, of ethnography, of writing descriptions of 
single societies. Relativism, along with those two things, relativism is anthropology's most widely influential contribution to modern thought. You know, even people who don't know anything else about anthropology have probably encountered relativism. In fact, the intellectual historian David Hollinger went so far as to point, point, put, make the observation that the development of relativism, quote, constituted a major episode in intellectual history of the 20th century rather than simply another movement within a discipline. The truth of Hollinger's claim is, is likely borne out by the fact that the kind of quick, very elementary account I just gave of relativism probably wasn't news to any of you. I'm kind of guessing all of you kind of had a sense about relativism before. That doesn't mean you accepted it. It doesn't mean you live your life in terms of it. But almost everybody's kind of heard of it by this point, I think. Throughout the 20th century, and this is the point I want to get to, relativism was central to North American anthropology. It was, among other things, a staple of introdu introductory teaching in the subject. Okay? And in introductory teaching, anthropologists, we, tended to, to introduce relativism by the strategy of confronting students with cultural ideas or practices that at first sight might appear unexcusable to them, such as radically divergent and inequitable gender roles, or infanticide, or extremely painful or injur injurious initiation rituals, asking the students to suspend judgment long enough for us to show how these ideas and practices are meaningful, and thus perhaps excusable, within the cultural formations of those who participate in them. And by those kind of pedagogical means, by that kind of teaching, young anthropologists were instructed in how, precisely, in how to withhold judgment in order properly to understand, and in the last century at least, probably also to respect, the ways of life of those they study. A lot of anthropological teaching wasn't about this fact or that fact about other cultures. It was about learning how to withhold judgment so that you could figure out how people, as the cliche went and goes, made sense, make sense in their own terms. Okay, very quickly to clear up a confusion that could arise at this point, when I say anthropologists, well, no, right, what's recently changed, sorry about that, what's recently changed in anthropology is that many anthropologists no longer want to withhold judgment people they study. Many anthropologists now want to be able to call out situations in which they feel the people they study or they judge that the people they study are not living well, ones in which the people they study are suffering, poor, oppressed, or otherwise not living what the anthropologist's own culture defines as a good life. Okay, all of a sudden, say in the last 15, 20 years, Anthropologists have actually begun to pass judgment on the quality of lives of the people they study. I, just to clear up a really quick confusion, it'd be very, I sort of figured this out as I was working on this. This isn't in the book, and I, it bears more thought, but we don't have time for that today. When I say anthropologists are quick to judge the people they study now in a way they weren't before, that doesn't mean that they blame them. Judgment doesn't mean blame. If anthropologists do cast blame, it's generally on kind of wider structures that they feel are, are, are causing what they see as problems in the lives of the people they study. Or if it's going to be people, it's people who live usually far away. It's not the people the anthropologists are studying. It's more powerful people living elsewhere who are setting the conditions which people live. So I'm not saying that anthropologists are, are running around blaming the people they study, but they are saying they're living less than optimal lives. And that means that anthropologists really aren't so comfortable anymore taking a relativist stance to the lives of those they study. Now, to understand the depth of this change, we can see that becoming a relativist, we can see becoming a relativist as a matter of what Clifford Geertz once called, I'm quoting him here, a personal subjection to a vocational ethic, or what Weber would have called a commitment to a form of asceticism. It's a form of asceticism to say, I'm going to control my judgmental impulses, because all human beings judgmental impulses, 
it's a form of asceticism to say, I'm going to control mine so that I can be open to studying how other people understand their lives. So what's changed is that this ascetic, this ascetic ethic, this subjection to a vocational ethic of ascetically controlling your own judgments has lost its appeal to a lot of young anthropologists. They no longer want to practice what one philosopher called the kind of moral recusal, moral standing back in the face of different lives, people live in different societies, that relativism involved. And anthropological work is thus now very thick with judgment. And potentials to pass judgment do a lot to shape the topics anthropologists want to study. They want to study people whose lives they feel are less than optimal. As the very influential anthropologist Sherry Ortner recently put it, what we have now is what she calls dark anthropology, an anthropology focused on ways of life that go badly around the world, rather than an older anthropology which really concerned itself with the integrity of other people's way of life. In another talk, or one where I wasn't rapidly running out of time, um, we could talk about why this change happened when it did. I'm not sure I can fully answer it, but it's interesting to think about some of the possible reasons. But instead, the goal of the rest of this talk for me is to explore the following question. If anthropologists now want to judge the lives of those they study, on what grounds should they do so? I'm not going to figure out what the grounds are today. I mean, I don't know them, and we're not going to figure them out in the next 10 minutes. However, um, I do want to at least get the question posed. And I, and I think it's an important question to pose precisely because of the anthropological history of being very relativistic. We don't actually have a very strong set of ideas about what criteria you should use in judgments across cultures. When we do make judgments about cultures, we tend to just draw on our own cultural definitions of what good lives are like. We tend to draw on, on what the religious studies scholar Richard Miller, speaking about his own discipline, in similar terms, calls strong yet undefended normative claims about what constitutes a good life. And they're undefended because they're part of our own, the anthropologist's own, common sense, which of course means they need no defense. In this regard, and this is where this gets interesting for my anthropology theology project, in this regard, theology is quite different. Okay? As the anthropologist, very influential theologian Catherine Tanner puts it, theologians need to, quote, make, uh, need to make normative theological judgments, judgments about what is authentically Christian, close quote. Okay? Theology is not possessed of a history of relativism. Theological education doesn't teach young people how to withhold judgment. It teaches them how to make judgments and how to develop explicit criteria for making those judgments. It means that anthropologists and theologians have been trained in almost opposite ways when it comes to judgment. Theologians have been trained in how to make them. Anthropologists have been trained in how to avoid them. Um, if anthropologists now want to start making judgments, they might learn something about ways of doing so responsibly by looking at how theologians go about doing a task that theologians themselves have long been trained for and have practiced. So let me quickly illustrate uh, what, I, what I have in mind here by looking at a form of Christianity that has recently been of interest both to some anthropologists and to some so I'm going to take a particular case here. I'm going to have to do this really fast. Um, the, the type of Christianity I'm, I'm interested in here is called the prosperity gospel. Have people all heard of that? Is that um, you know this is the also sometimes known as the health and wealth gospel or positive confession or the word faith gospel. It's a type of Christianity in which believers understand that God has promised them health and wealth on this earth through Christ's atonement. And, all, and that asserts that all believers have to do to claim what God owes them is to have faith, ask God in prayer for what they need, and tithe or otherwise give to the prosperity gospel congregation that they attend. It's an outgrowth of Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity, which has grown immensely around the world in the last century, and it's become hugely popular in parts of the global south, and elsewhere, including prominently in the United States, where Trump gave it a boost by welcoming some of its leaders as advisors, along with other 
evangelicals. So this is by no means a tiny movement. The prosperity gospel is of particular interest in relation to my question about making judgments across cultures, because it's a form of Christianity that many theologians and many anthropologists of Christianity both find extremely unattractive. Okay, Even anthropologists who are open to studying Christianity don't tend to be thrilled by the prosperity gospel, and the same is true for many, many academic theologians. Theologians have called it such things as, I really like this one, quote, Pentecostalism as its parentheses, ne Pentecostalism at its parentheses near worst. You wonder what, what, what he thinks the, the worst one is. But anyway, or uh, as a very distinguished theologian uh, recently called it, a, you know, a form of abusive religion. Anthropologists likewise have thought of it as a kind of abusive religion that takes money from very poor people through tithes uh, and, 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 and gives nothing back. I mean, prosperity gospel churches do not have development arms. They don't have health arms. They don't have... So, um, um, so it, it's disliked by both, both kinds of scholars, theologians and anthropologists. Um, but in the end, anthropologists don't have very well, I, I mean, I'm cutting some stuff here, so I hope this still makes sense. In the end, anthropologists do not have very well-defined grounds for articulating their dislike of this form of Christianity, except to say that it, it doesn't seem to contribute to what the anthropologists themselves think of as a good life, and it's not a good way of understanding the contemporary worlds in which people live. They tend to think of it as an ignorant person's understanding of a global capitalist system they participate in but can't understand, right? They you kind of get magical ideas based on God's favor rather than on, say, controlling wealth and labor and things like that. Um, but matters are different with theologians who have a well-laid-out set of criteria for judging the status of the prosperity gospel as an expression of Christianity. Okay, and these criteria for judgment, if you read theologians talking about the prosperity gospel, take three broad forms, and I'm going to just go through these really quickly without actually giving much in the way of examples. But some theologians check the accuracy of prosperity preachers' biblical pronouncements in support of their, doctrine, of their doctrines against other more academically acceptable ways of interpreting the text that prosperity gospel preachers tend to cite. So to take a well-known example, the, the important Pentecostal biblical scholar Gordon Fee points to the verse 3 John 2, which in the King James Version reads, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And prosperity pro preachers tend to take this verse to express God's promise that his followers will have health and wealth on earth. But Fee points out that if you look back at, at other writings at the time when 3 John was written, this is actually a completely arbitrary interpretation because this phrase, I wish above all things that you may prosper, et cetera, et cetera, was actually just a common closing to a letter, sort of like, I hope you're well, or, you know, wish you well, or whatever. It, it really wasn't in any way making a promise, okay? So one way is to check their biblical interpretations against more, more more accepted ways of interpreting the Bible. A second form of theological critique checks uh, prosperity understandings not just against the Bible, but against traditional, what they would call traditional Christian teachings. I'm going to skip, um, I'm going to skip uh, um, almost all of what I would have said about this, except to say that one thing they often tend to say is that in this idea that God is obligated to reward people on earth if they do the, if they believe rightly and they tithe rightly, it, 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 it comes very close to magic suggesting that God has to do. If you do, the, do X, God has to do Y. And to them, to these, theolo these theologians, that violates their sense of God's sovereign freedom, which they feel is an important part of the Christian tradition. Okay, a third way that, they, that theologians sometimes critique the prosperity gospel is to say, well, it could be an appropriate way of contextualizing the Christian message in people's own cultural settings, but then in the end they find that it isn't an appropriate way because, well, I'll give you one 
example. I won't tell you how he saw parts of contextualism, saw how he saw the prosperity gospel being a contextualization, because that would take too long, but he ultimately criticized it as a contextualization of the prosperity gospel of African migrants in Finland by saying that, you know, a church that's really only for the socially attractive and, the, and, and, and those who are doing well can't possibly be a church for all. And that means this is Christianity losing its distinctive features and becoming a lot more like capitalist ideology rather than it contextualizing capitalist ideology within its own terms. Okay, now, my point in saying in laying out that theologians have these kind of criteria for judgment that they've all studied, they all agree on, et cetera, and a, of other forms of Christianity than the ones they practice. And anthropologists don't really have a very well worked out set of criteria for judging across cultures. Isn't to say that anthropology should take over theology's criteria. Obviously, that's not true. What I, I mean, or that's not going to happen, and it's not going to work. Instead, I want to say that if anthropology wants to become a discipline that judges its objects of study, that it's going to have to develop its own criteria for judgment. It's going to have to lay them out clearly the way theologians do. It's going to have to teach them to students, and then it's going to have to open them up to debate. Now, I think it would be a great sacrifice of anthropology's original strengths as a discipline most, as the discipline most obligated to studying other cultures. If anthropology were to continue to avoid developing such criteria in its own anthropological terms and instead continue to use Western common sense models of the good life as its only standard for judgment. And I've I've been arguing lately for a comparative anthropological study of the different ways cultures define the good life as one possible start to a search for such, an, for such anthropologically relevant criteria for judgment. But that's really a topic for another time, this idea of studying different cultures' definitions of the good. For now, I want to leave you with the thought that one thing that anthropology, newly interested in judgment, and other social sciences might learn from theology is how to be a self-consciously judgmental discipline, one that makes its criteria for judgment clear and open to debate. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have you stare. So, so we uh, we do have some time for questions. What we'd invite you to do is to just stay where you're comfortable right now. Stand up. Tell us your name, and if you're a student, your major. If you're faculty or admin or staff, tell us where you're coming from. And uh, just please keep your questions very brief. We will bring a microphone to you uh, for those who are in the overflow, especially. So, yes, yeah, so we can start right here. Please. I'm a student. A little bit more. My name is Rebecca. I'm a student of psychology. And I have studied slash read that um, many cultures in a global sense kind of define um, human flourishing along similar principles. It sounds like what you were talking about as, as the good life. Do anthropologists tend to agree with some of those principles that there are universal um, principles that cultures consider a part of human flourishing, and would that be a basis for maybe forming that judgment? That, that's a that's a fantastic question. I I mean, and I think that gets to where the heart of the kind of debate that anthropology needs to have. I think, in first principles, an older anthropology would say that except at the very, very, very most general level, no, there aren't common definitions of human flourishing. Um, there, there might, you know, you might be able to say things like, well, everybody thinks children should live and be able to grow into adults. But what it means to grow into an adult and all of that is utterly different in different places. Am I, am I making sense? And so, um, and I, and I, unfortunately, because these take a long time to lay out, I laid out my one real example of a culturally different notion of the good life in this 
in this paper. But just to, just to I mean, I'm, you know, if people want to ask more about this, I'll say more. But uh, one of the things that's become very uh, popular in anthropology is talking about places where people actually want to live within hierarchical social relationships. They don't want to live within egalitarian ones. That's a very strong version of the good life in many places. You feel secure and happy and like you have possibilities when you have people above you and people below you, not where everybody's equal. That would defeat a kind of common Western idea of what the good life is about. But having arguments about what does constitute human flourishing, who gets to decide, and then how much it really can differ or not is part of what's going to have to happen here. So I, I do think that's the right question to be asking. That's somebody in the back. Um, I think, but then you got somebody in the back. After David, there's somebody in the back. OK. Sorry about that. Thank you, Joel. I very much enjoyed your paper, as always. Um, two quick questions. One is, I think of your last comment about anthropologists and the value of conversation, making things explicit and debating them. And we're very good at arguing with each other, so please allow me. Uh, <laughs> you know, as I hear you talk about um, prosperity gospel, and you're citing theologians, right. and you're citing the kind of textual critique of the scripture right. that's often cited for prosperity, immediately I can hear prosperity people response. And so part of what I want, well, the response would be it's the word of God, not in the text, but as we read the text and as we understand God entering us. Yes. And so it's a very different notion of God as opposed to the textualist. And we can argue that and discuss it. That's my sense of it from hanging out with them. But um, it strikes me that this is one of the strengths of anthropology, that we're experienced near. Right. And so we have these voices, maybe we're schizophrenic, but we have all these voices <laughs> from different peoples around the world, and we're in a context where there are universalisms developing. And that's nothing new. The West has been strong on universalisms. The locus of the universalism is different. So, for example, where I work in Bolivia, as you know, there's been a huge push to destroy people's drinking habits. Mm. And yet alcohol is very, very important for indigenous reality and indigenous culture. Right. It's cited by the Spanish in a kind of othering, but when you live there, you can sense it very carefully. Um, Juan Osio, a very prominent anthropologist, told me I never work as an Indian anthropologist because I didn't drink. Hmm. And so drinking is very important, but it's being destroyed. Why? The Bolivian government, the Peruvian government are intervening, they're, the Catholic Church, they're den denying drinking and fiestas, uh, keeping drinking to the sidelines, right. and trying to encourage people not to get drunk. Yet being drunk is the point of drinking, it's, and it has spiritual value. There's a lot of thought right. there. Well, where does this come from? It's not the governments themselves. Even though it relates to a value they promote, which in Quechua is sumach kausai, meaning the good life. Right. That value is part of the indigenous movement as a modern place of ethnic revindication or revalidation. And it fits into international treaties. It's part of international people's movements. And the drinking part goes right to the World Health Organization. And as countries sign treaties, they become obliged to implement World Health dictates. And hence, they're den denying drinking. So there's a tension here. It's not just anthropologists. Oh, no. This is part of a global system. I mean, we're relatively powerless. We often don't have jobs. We're seeking any kind of employment we can get. But um, it comes from the top, so to speak, from these fora of debates where values are decided upon and then instituted, in this case, medical values, but they're taking a religious form and they start denying people's own action and own values. So I'm a non-drinker, but as an anthropologist, I'm mostly a non-drinker, but as an anthropologist, I find myself ventriloquating to people I've worked with to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's more to the story. You're destroying their culture. And I'll say this right to the Bolivian thinkers who are imposing it will respond to me, but health, health, health. And so we've got different universal values. I agree with you. We don't have a good way of working through those or of articulating or understanding them. And I, as to re say again what I said, I think we're experienced near, and I think that's a strength. What do you think? Oh, I, I completely agree uh, that it's a strength. And part of the undertow of this kind of argument in an anthropological context is maybe you 
you should be a little more careful in your rush to judgment. Um, but if you're going, so, and so I wasn't, for example, saying that I would expect prosperity gospel people to accept these two. No, no, but I think it's a good point to bring up. Um, but they might not be so quick to accept our judgments either. Do you know what I mean? And so I, I agree with you. I also think it goes back to the earlier point that Rebecca was at, you know, asked in the sense that sort of probably around the world, people think having good relations with others is, is part of the good life. But in some places, drinking together counts as that. As a non-drinker who has recently moved to England, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, you just can't have social. It's really quite striking. Anyway, um, but so, so I'm really, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. And, and part of the point of this comparison is to say, slow down. I mean, I sort of want anthropologists to think, well, those theologians, they're, they're being, they're, they're going to miss the mark with their judgments. Well, we might also. That's, so partially I mean it to be an object lesson and staying experience near and not, not being so quick to assume that your definitions of the good life, even if they're enshrined by the World Health Organization, are, are the right ones. Yeah. Um, my name is Lizzie. I'm a history and sociocultural um, anthropology double major. I'm a freshman, so I'm in Professor Haug's Anthropology 101 class. Um, but when you said we're talking about a criteria for judging the good life, what I immediately thought of that is pretty distinctive is the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is very, I mean, it talks about really broad things, but that's like the opposite of cultural relativism to go into a country as an interna like international developer or human rights activist and say like, this is wrong, you deserve this, and then like, he was just saying, like, maybe tearing down in the name of well-being things that are really culturally, like, integral to this, like, place. And so what are, like, the ethics of that? Because our entire welfare system in, like, international development is built around this conception of the good life that we're trying to bring to people. But I know that there's often, like, a really great sense of cultural loss. What do we do about that? That's, that's great. And thank you very much for that question because it allows me to bring out something that you know, I, I couldn't. One of the ways I kind of get at the change that anthropology has gone through from being non-judgmental to being judgmental is that in, was it 1948, there was a comment period on the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and the American Anthropological Association submitted a brief written by Melville Herskovitz, who was one of the first people to really spell out cultural relativism as like a doctrine, not just a kind of way of carrying on, saying, eh, maybe this human rights thing is a little culture bound because it's all about individuals and their rights. And in a lot of societies, individuals kind of aren't the key, key things. Maybe hierarchies are, or maybe relationships are. Um, I have always thought of that as a moment of real bravery on the part of anthropologists. Starting in the 90s, anthropologists began apologizing for that. They called it the most embarrassing moment in anthropology's history, that it would question the global validity of human rights and the importance of the human rights doctrine. So it's a complete about face, right? Um, so, I, so I think you've hit at something that's really, really tough for anthropology, the sense, wow, you know, I, I, I don't want to run on and on, right? But oftentimes, in practice, when people in some societies assert their human rights, what they end up doing is removing themselves from relationships which define the good life for them, and they, they, they were unaware of the consequences of doing that. And again, I'm just saying as an anthropologist to judge that rather than to study it in, in situ and all the meanings it has is probably not the way we should be making judgments. And if we want to make judgments, we're going to have to find criteria for doing it that do keep in mind not just the cultural loss, but the loss for a person who, who goes, you know, you could go to court and, and win. I, I don't think we have time to get into details, but you could win a court on a human rights basis, but then you'd have to go back and live in a community that you just asserted yourself completely independent of. And so, yeah, I think that's a, 
a real, t the, an the changing anthropological approach to human rights is absolutely been a leading edge of this move from not judging to judging. So thanks for that. Uh, my name is Ellie, and I'm an archaeology major. And do you think that, I guess, first of all, is the rise in judgment in the field of anthropology beneficial to this study? And if it is with such a difficulty of pinning down like a universal definition of a good life, is it possible to create criteria for judgment that we could use to judge other cultures safely? Yeah. Safely, yeah, safely. No, it's interesting because I probably wouldn't have used the word safely, but that's an interesting word for it, too. I, I would have used sort of responsibly. It's very interesting. But um, wait, what was the first part again? Because that's what I wanted to start with. There was two parts to the question. and I. Um, do you think it's beneficial to the field yeah, of anthropology? Yes. So here's the situation. I'm going to be very honest, right? Do I, I was trained in this kind of relativism, which I kind of tried to hint in the paper is a very deep kind of training. It's not just learn a doctrine and be able to answer a question on, on a test. It's being asked to accept a way of life, right? That's what Geertz was saying by vocational ethic. I find it really, really hard to think that this kind of judgment is a good thing for anthropology. At the same time, I recognize that the kind of culture of the discipline has changed. And a lot of anthropologists do want to be able to make judgments. And what I'm trying to do in some sense is build a bridge from some of the kind of things I think I learned and was taught that aren't so learned and taught anymore to where people want to be now. So do I think it's a good thing for the discipline? N not the discipline as I came into it, but I kind of realized that for the discipline people, and I might not have gone into it today, but for the discipline that people go into today, this is what they want to do. So how are we going to do it without losing everything we know about studying people in their own terms, being experienced near? So you know, if you're asking about my personal feelings, I'm, I'm unsettled by it, but I also recognize that the ground, it, it could shift again, but right now the ground has, has really has shifted. And so we're going to have to have an anthropology that has judgment in it. So how are we going to make the best of that? And how are we going to make it safe, in your terms, I like that, or, or responsible, and not run into these you know, things that you can see messing up from a mile away, like banning you know, the cargo system and drinking in, 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 in Bolivia, or, or, um, or yes, um, you know, allowing people to, to win. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Do you get, does that make sense? But, but that's about feelings. You know, I'm working this, I'm trying to now bring some intellectual tools to working through my feelings that anthropology really has changed and that I'm, yeah, I'm not that comfortable with it, but I also recognize that it's real. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Got one. Yeah. Um, so my name is Talmadge. I'm a computer science major. Um, I'm in Professor Hogg's class. And the question I had is, as I've started to read some of these um, works and articles and things written by anthropologists, it seems like they want to avoid making very definitive statements about a specific culture. They always, they'll put theories out, they'll put all these ideas out, but they'll never make a definitive statement. It seems like it could be a product of the cultural relativism that you were talking about. Do you think more younger anthropologists wanting to pass judgment is a pushback to this? Yeah, that's really because a, a, a really um, important anthropologist uh, we were talking about this morning, maybe he's come and spoken here, Webb Keen, um, he, uh, he put in print, but what all anthropologists know is that um, people will sometimes come to ask us about for our opinion on something, or, or maybe our advice, right? Um, you know, maybe they would come and ask me where I worked about the Eurotman, is it good to develop a mine there? Because there's some minerals. And anthropologists always begin their answers by saying, well, it's really complicated. And by the time you're done with that statement, they're rolling their eyes, they're done. You've lost them, right? 
Um, and it's complicated because everything needs to be understood in context of everything else because it all makes sense together. And I do think younger anthropologists are pushing back against the kind of powerless position that leaves anthropologists in. We are not, we're not bad at speaking to the public like in documentaries or something, but we are very bad at speaking to people who want to take action because they're just, they're not interested in all the complications. And so, yes, I think there is a certain, I mean, I think one, I mean, I hadn't thought about this, but one of the conditions that's changed, you know, I said we, I wasn't going to talk about why it was changing, but most, many younger anthropologists are planning to go into development, they're planning to go into consulting, they're planning to go into uh, even people who are getting PhDs, right? I mean, they're not planning to go into academia. And so this Deep appreciation for complication is isn't going to be uh, isn't going to allow them to do what they want to do. So I think actually it is a pushback, and probably a pushback that makes a certain kind of sense, given the ways they see their lives unfolding. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm sorry. I want to respect uh, our time, I, but I. I, this a discussion about develop a cultural construct. You know. That's right. It is. <laughs> um, but I, the I, you know, this discussion about developing criteria for judgment. Um, you know, I think it may be helpful to acknowledge. You know, something else you've written about is uh, that um, it, it perhaps inspired by um, Marilyn Strathern's work on feminism and its relationship to anthropology. Mm -hmm another discipline that is very invested in difference and yet also v invested in making judgments yes. and often, you know, pl at least playing with the universal. Um, and I, which really is an awkward relationship with anthropology. Right. And uh, uh, I, the great irony being most anthropologists would consider themselves sympathetic right. to s s feminism. Right. And uh, so um, it, it, that awkwardness, nonetheless, is productive and it's good because it shows us the kind of blind spots of the two disciplines or trains of thought. So that's the utility of thinking about anth uh, theology this way. Right. It is, in fact, awkward and it forces us to think about criteria of judgment. When we're thinking of the criteria of judgment in anthropology, there have been some people who have proposed some criteria, and I want to explore one of them: freedom. Mm. And I, you know, and that's not to say that freedom is individual freedom or what freedom everyone in this room may think of as freedom, but it could be freedom to reproduce your community. It could be freedom to have self-determination. It does seem that every culture has an idea of the ability to reproduce itself or freedom as some kind of expression. Interest, where I work, the word for freedom is the same word as unity. Mm, right, one bell, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which yeah. just blows my mind. So I, I'm curious if, if you know, I, I know you have a colleague, colleague who has written a lot about this, but I'm curious where you're standing on that. It, could this be a potential criteria for thinking about what is it that every culture does value? Again, there's, a, there's the, I mean, in, in some, the, the feminism point goes back, I think, to the last question from Talmadge also, and that part of what Marilyn was getting at is that Feminists are actually really good at injecting their ideas into a community that's willing to organize around them, but they find it hard to convince people that there truly are other ways of living. Anthropologists can really find it easy to show you there are other ways of living, but they can't form communities around a, 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 the goal of living differently very well. Um, freedom is, again, that's one of those questions whether we have to go up to such a level of generality um, that, yes, everybody wants to do what they want, but so I, I'm, 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 I, I haven't sorted freedom out myself. Um, 
I will say that um, Zygmunt Bauman, the sociologist, once said that, uh, and he's kind of was pretty interesting. He's you could probably buy his books at like the local Barnes and Noble. I mean, he was really uh, became very popular for a time. He he grew up in in communist Poland, and ended up coming to the UK in 1968 or so, and and became a very prominent sociologist there. But so he had very experience of living in very different. Um, social regimes, he, he once said, well, really, sociology is the science of unfreedom. It, it, and anthropology, too, is sort of the science of how we live within the frameworks our culture set for us. But within that, whether people have ideas about freedom and things, yeah, I, it's a, I, I guess I haven't, I do, have, I mean, I think it's important, I think what James Laidlaw, who's my colleague, referred to, I'm just, he really means that people do reflect on their choices, and people do want to make their own choices. I think that's right. Whether they have an abstract notion of freedom, meaning that they could make any choice they choose, isn't it? There is you, uh, uh, somebody who has a relationship with Jordan, um, Leanne Williams Green, is kind of trying. She works with a very, very theologically astute Baptists in Zimbabwe, who have they have a, com a complicated relationship to freedom because God is sovereign. But if God is sovereign, then how can they be responsible for what they do? And they spend a lot of time talking about this. So she's trying to work out, you know, what does freedom mean in that context where it isn't the beginning of your ethical life. The beginning of your ethical life is your relationship to God and God's sovereignty. But still you do have ethical responsibilities. So how are you going to work that out? Um, she doesn't have an answer yet. It's like, <laughs> you'll just have to stick around for her, her talk sometime. But it's a great question, but I, I, I don't have a great answer. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.